Here's a segment from a recent Gun Talk radio episode. You can listen to all the Gun Talk radio podcasts however you tune in, or check out guntalk.com for more. Eric called in from Colorado Springs on 1A. Eric, you got a range report for us. What you been shooting? Well, I just want you to know that the last time I called you, I was mad at you because you made me poorer. But now I'm downright furious with you because I just come to the conclusion that you're bound to determine and make me destitute. Well, that's my job, man. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there, there needs to be wanted posters with your mug on them saying the great enabler strikes again. So what'd you buy? So the last couple shows, you were talking about that new loophole Delta Point Micro. Oh, yeah. So I got one. And? So, you know, I was, I was very intrigued with it by your report because I'd wanted to read that for many years. Mm -hmm. I just wasn't keen on the idea of having the slide milled out and just the high profile nature, possibly sacrificing concealability. Right. So this one really intrigued me. So, I mean, insulation couldn't have been easier. And that's saying something for a guy like me. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I mean, Um, you slide out the rear sight and you slide this one in, you're good to go. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, So took it to the range. Zeroing it was really easy. Um, I wasn't sure how shooting it was going to be with that small window. Mm -hmm. I found that to be pretty much a non-issue. Now, you know, it it being a red dot, I don't have a whole lot of experience with red dots. So I'm, I need to seek out a trainer to kind of show me how to, how to use it, you know, presentation, recovery, recoil. Yeah. You kind of have to adjust to it. It's different, but yeah, I mean, it looks tiny and you're thinking, how can I possibly use this? How's it going to work? So when you got to the range and started shooting it, what did you think? So, you know, once I could acquire the dots, I just, you know, if, if I did my job, and that's kind of the big variable in that equation, mm-hmm. um, that thing was, it was on. And I mean, I'm talking, I brought the target out to 25 yards, and I was getting good body hits at 25 yards with that thing, provided I was doing what I was supposed to be doing. Right. Did and, you and, feel like, once you got it all figured out, did you feel like it slowed you down? Yes. So, and it's interesting because I was actually going to mention that. Um, mm-hmm. I'm finding myself, because of that adjustment you, you talked about, I'm having to return back to the basics, just go very, very slowly and be very right. methodical with everything. Right. right. Um, That's exactly and, what I found. It's like, okay, I, I'm going to have to slow down and start picking up my speed again because it's a new skill I'm working on. Yes. And I had a, it, was, it was drilled into me many years ago in a holster drawing class that I took. A trainer drilled into us. You know, take your time. The speed will come. Yes, so, exactly. Um, I, I don't I don't have it on my everyday carry gun just yet because I don't feel proficient enough to use it. But with practice, you know, I, mm-hmm. I will put it on my EDC gun, which I think is going to present a pretty interesting experiment because I have a Crimson Trace green laser on it. Oh, interesting. So it'll be interesting to see how both of those work because... I have a friend of mine who has a red dot on his gun. I've got a laser on mine. Mm -hmm. And we've been to the range together and seeing the advantages and disadvantages of both. Well, a suggestion I would make is adjust your Crimson Trace laser so that when you're looking, using the red dot, you cannot see the laser. You don't want to see both of them at the same time. You want that laser to be lower. Okay. Oh, good point. Yes. Now, in that way, here's the deal. Uh, my theory is this, if you come up and for whatever reason you can't see the laser, it's not turned on, there's something going on, it's blocked, whatever, I'm not the laser, I'm, I'm correction, the, uh, the uh, Delta red Point dot. Micro, the red dot. If you can't see the red dot, what are you going to do? You're going to do like a gopher, your head's going to pop up, right? And when your head pops up, you're going to see the green laser. There it is. Sure. I think that's the way I would set that up. But one thing I was going to suggest is do like a lot of slow drills of drawing and coming out and acquiring that red dot and then holding it and then coming back into the holster and just do it over and over again at home. Just dry fire, work on that. A thousand draws like that will have you where you need to be. Okay, yeah. I, and I've been doing that over the past couple of days. Um, my My theory with the laser and the red dot is, mm-hmm. is the laser does a great job at short range, mm-hmm. but 
as the distance increases, especially in broad daylight, even though it's a green laser, you get to where you can't see it anymore. Right. And at exactly. longer distances, that's where the red dot really shines. I think you're right. And I think a lot of us are going to take a, a new look, a fresh look at optics at red dots. I, look, I appreciate the call, Eric, and uh, congratulations on the, the uh, new acquisition. And, hey, I'll take all the blame you want to heap at me because you're happy and I'm happy and everybody's happy with us. It works out well. Yeah, I'm thinking about this uh, mall shooting, and uh, Eli Dickin is making hits at 40, the numbers I have heard are 43 yards for people who have actually seen the video and seen what he did and how he crouched down behind this kind of trash can receptacle, whatever it was, one of those big square rectangular things, and started putting, I mean, within 15 seconds of the mall shooting starting, he was throwing rounds down range. Not just throwing them, he was placing them precisely. First shot, I'm told, actually was the shot that dropped the shooter. And the shooter kept moving and trying to move around and get up and, and all that. And Eli just kept shooting him. He says, no, basically, I mean, the mindset had to be, you are not going to get up and start shooting other people. Not today, not on my watch, not with my girlfriend here, not with me here, not with my friends, not where I live. You are not going to do this. No. And I think it's a mindset we all need to start thinking of because we've all talked about would I get involved? Would I inject myself? Would I intervene? On the one end, you can say, well, it's not my deal and other people should have car carried. I'm going to get my family out. Okay, I get that. I'm, I'm not going to quarrel with that. At the same time, I think it is equally valid to say, yes, not on my watch, not in my town, not around my family, not with my girlfriend here, not with innocent people here. If I have the ability, I am going to stop you. And oh, by the way, can we do away with the euphemisms of he neutralized the threat? Really? He put him down? Really? How about he shot him and he killed him? Simple, declarative sentence always works better. Why are we trying to hide what happened? He shot him, and he killed him, and he did a very good thing. Now, you can say, oh, it's tragic this had to happen. Yeah, probably true. You know, oh, it's terrible, it's unfortunate. Yes, that's all true. But I think, I think we can agree that shooting this madman is a good thing. Killing this guy is a good thing. Thing. And the only reason there are people who think it's not a good thing is because Eli wasn't wearing the proper clothing. What do you mean, Tom? <sighs> there are people who think the killing should have continued. Killing of innocent people should have continued until someone wearing a uniform showed up. As insane as that sounds, as callous as that sounds, as clueless as that sounds... For them, someone who's not wearing a uniform to shoot and stop this guy is simply wrong. I don't really understand it. I think there's a, a, a mindset of we must depend upon the state, the government, the authorities for everything. And we can't do this by ourselves. That would make you a vigilante. People need to go look up the definition of the word vigilante, by the way. It means breaking the law, for one thing. Oh, and there are people who say, oh, well, you know, he broke the law because he was in this mall and they have a no-gun sign. Wrong. Yes, they did have a no-gun sign. But in Indiana, that's not law. You can go in there with a gun. It's not breaking the law. It's breaking a corporate policy. Who the hell cares? He saved lives. Are you kidding me? Even the manager of the mall praised this guy. He praised Eli for saving lives. Now, will the corporate owners of the mall take down the no-gun signs? Probably not. But understand, as Eli did, you can go in there on your own. It's, it's okay to go in armed. Now, this very state to state, you got to know your rules. Now, there's one really sad part of this, is there's one of the people who got shot and killed by the madman was carrying a gun. So people say, well, you know, there's no guarantee. Yes, I've always said there's no guarantee. Just because you're carrying a gun doesn't mean you're going to be able to, that's quite true. 
If someone shoots you before you even know anything's going on, you just get shot. The way it is. And that's tragic and that's sad. But in this case, this 22-year-old man, and with no law enforcement background, with no military training, the reports are, he said, he learned to shoot from his grandfather. Can't help but think that there's something more going on here. Anybody who can make shots like that has been shooting, has been practicing. And I think, this is just me thinking, I'm projecting now. We always say that you can't go there if you haven't thought about it. What is it? Chris Reno says, the body won't go where the mind hasn't already been. I think he's been there in his mind before. I think that's the only way you react that quickly, that positively, and that effectively is that you've already been there in your mind. Yeah, Jim points out, by the way, he didn't have a carry permit. Well, how could he do that? <laughs> because two weeks before this shooting, Indiana's constitutional carry went into effect. Where regular, ordinary people did not have to say, Mother, may I ask permission, pay hundreds of dollars to get a permit and wait weeks or months to get a permit. Anybody who could legally own a gun, who was an adult, could carry. And he did. Constitutional carry saves lives. We know it just did. So here's the question. He fired 10 shots. How, how many times have we said or heard people say, well, you know, the average the average gunfight is three to five yards. The average gunfight is two to three rounds. I think that comes from a different age, an age, frankly, of revolvers. An age when criminals were different. When we didn't have to shoot somebody who has an AR from 40 yards away. So the question is, is it time for us to rethink what we carry in terms of guns? Can, you know, do you carry a gun that's capable of making those shots? Do you carry a gun that has enough ammo in it? How do you actually train? How do you make shots at this distance? For a lot of people, it might be time to start looking at red dots and optics. Now, I'm, I'm a pretty fair shot. Even, you know, at my age, I can still see the sights okay. And I feel pretty confident that I could hit a man-sized steel target at 50 yards most of the time with iron sights. But I also acknowledge that I'm going to do better in putting shots on target with a red dot, with an optic. I just am. It's more precise. You get the whole rear sight, front sight, target way out there. Is everything lined up just the way it is? Now, yes, the trigger is the most important thing. Can you press a trigger without disturbing the sights? Yes, I understand that. But at that distance, you need precise aiming. And a dot allows you to do that. I think a lot of people are going to take a fresh look at what they carry and how their carry gun is equipped and maybe we'll start going and doing the Eli drill. Your basic man size zip sick or USPSA type target out at 40 yards. Eight, you got 10 shots, you need to make eight hits. There was no time limit on that. It was 15 seconds from when it started to when he started shooting, but we don't yet know how long it took, how long he was shooting. Tell you what, when we come back, let's talk with a literally a world champion shooter who's done an awful lot of longer range shooting in competition. Find out how he does it and what he recommends. This is Gun Talk, 866-TALK-GUN. So, in an Indiana mall, a crazy man takes an AR-15 and starts killing people. A 22-year-old young man with his girlfriend shoves her down to the ground, says, get down and stay down, draws his, what we think now, is a Glock. And from a range of 40, I'm told actually 43 yards, puts 8 out of 10 shots on the bad guy. 
stopping him immediately and eventually killing him. The question is, with your everyday carry gun, could you make consistent hits at 40 yards? Well, let's talk to a guy who actually can and does that, and it's done that in competition for many, many years. Rob Latham, Latham from Springfield Armory joins me right now. Hey, Rob. How's it going, Tom? Well, excellent. I mean, I, when I heard about that, the first thing I thought of was Bianchi Cup and the barricade stage. You, you might just explain what that is. Well, it's interesting, you know, in the past, that's always been a portion of like uh, of law enforcement training and military training was always to be able to use not only items, walls, walls, uh, uh, fences, anything, not only mm -hmm. for cover, but for support Okay. to be able to gain, gain greater stability. So when you called me on that, it was kind of interesting. I'm like, wow, you know, I think back about it. It's been an integral part of a training I've done for decades always from the status of trying to get more stability. And mm -hmm. the Bianchi Cup, we shoot, uh, I think the furthest distance is 35 yards around the side of a wall. And um, I think we have to shoot six shots in five, six, eight seconds or something. To, and, and, and in the old PPC, did they shoot out to 50 yards in PPC? 50. Not, not only did they shoot a 50, they shot support side at 50 off a barricade. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Incredible. Incredible accuracy capability when you use support. So when you say you're using support, describe what you're talking about. Well, you know when you're standing there and you hold the gun up and all of a sudden it seems like there's either a hurricane or a <laughs> or an earthquake going on. Are, are you having a heart attack or something? <laughs> you're yeah. having a heart attack. Am I having a seizure right now? Especially under pressure, in my case, in a, in a competition. You, know, you look at the target, say everything looks good, and you hold the gun up there, and then the the dot or the sights are moving all over the target. Mm -hmm. So what you always want is how do I make that more stable? Because we know the gun shoots well enough. Practically every gun you can buy today would make those hits, but mm -hmm. the average guy has neither the skill nor the, I guess, knowledge or technique on how to do that. So it was always about how to get more stable. In the rifle world, it's all about stability. Right. So now we're seeing... We're seeing, and it's funny, I even I even addressed this in classes in the last four or five years, especially in law enforcement, say this is a different world. I used to have to teach you how to just to defend yourself if you were attacked. Now, unfortunately, you might have to make shots that are, some would consider either unrealistic or implausible, if that's a word. I make up my own words all the time. Well, and, you know, to your point, yeah, man, we used to say, well, the average gunfight is three to five feet or three to five yards, right. and it was three to five shots. But now we've got situations where you could have one of these guys decides to go in and run up the body count, and it's a case of if I don't shoot him from this distance, we're not going to get to shoot him, and that distance may be 25, 35, 40, 50 yards, and all you have is a handgun. Right, so now we have to address that basic problem. So it isn't just... I needed something that was easy to carry. Uh, the reality is um, the capability we need is greater. The equipment needs to address that. You're seeing it in some ways. I mean, the popularity of optical sights mm -hmm. on handguns directly addresses this problem. Absolutely. And I want to talk about that. We'll talk about that in just a second here. But one of the things I want to talk about, and look, for those who don't know, you have won literally dozens and dozens and dozens of national championships over a, a number of decades. I mean, from the time you were a teenager, you were winning this stuff. And now you're just an, almost an old fart. Not quite, but there. Oh, I'm an old fart. I'm officially an old fart. That's, that, that doesn't offend me at all. I consider it a badge of honor that I got this far. That's right. Still standing up and moving around and shooting stuff. There you go. Still winning, right. bad gummit. <laughs> so uh, there's a technique to hitting things at distance, and it's the same technique as hitting things up close, isn't it? Well, it's basically the same. You have to hold, I mean, no matter how skilled you get and experienced you get, it always comes back to basic, fundamental, foundational skills of create alignment, holding alignment, and firing the gun without ruining that alignment. And that's basically just, you know, it's just mechanical techniques to master, but the effort required, you know, if I had to have you hitting a, a silhouette target at five yards really fast, that's really not very hard. Mm -hmm. When that happens, we can focus instead on tactics and things. The mechanical techniques of creating stability, that's a whole different world. That's, that's, that's shooting. That's just shooting. That's nothing to do with the circumstance. 
you know, I'm just thinking about the times we've gotten together and done shooting. We always try to have some kind of fun when we're shooting. And I remember standing on top of a, a berm. I think we had the, the EMP one time, and we're shooting at steel like at 100 yards with this little pocket gun and yep. winging steel. And then we get down to South Louisiana, and we thought, well, we got the 10 millimeter, right? We had the, the two tens. And we thought, well, <laughs> let's just see what we can do. I think, if I remember right, we went out to pretty close to 300 yards with those. Yeah, that, I, if I had one well zeroed, I'd feel very comfortable with being, uh, being able to, you know, stand there and maybe hit you one out of three times. If you let me rest against something, I'll, I'll almost on a, on a silhouette-sized target, I'll always take the bet that I can hit it you know, three or four shots straight without too much trouble. And, and, but that only comes from having tried it, experiment with it, and doing stuff that, you know, I don't know, people would say, well, you guys are just goofy. Well, yeah, we are. We're always trying to challenge each other. Well, can you do this? Well, how about this? Oh, yeah, we'll try this, right? Yeah, it always turns into hold my beer and let's try this. Why wouldn't we be shooting snubbies at 100-yard targets? We don't know if we can hit them. Nobody would have ever known if you could hit them if you never tried. How would you know? Exactly right. We're talking with Rob Latham right now. He is a world champion many, many times over from Springfield Armory. And, Rob, I'm thinking about this guy. I'm thinking about the guns we carry traditionally. And more and more, I've been kind of leaning. I hate to say it, but I'm leaning toward having more ammo because who knows what we're going to run into. I'm thinking more than that even. I'm thinking beyond just the the more ammo because we can get capacity even in small guns. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking bigger. I'm thinking easier to shoot. Yes. I'm thinking maybe more accuracy than I would have ever thought I needed for that application. Yeah, you and me both. I'm thinking, okay, let's – I love the little micros, and they're easy to carry, but when it comes time to pull it out and do some work with it, I'm thinking going back to at least the midsize that yep. are easier to shoot, that have good triggers. You know, And I'd love to say it's a 1911, but that doesn't hold enough ammo. Well, I can make an argument for he only needed 10, and the reality is he probably got the job done with, with eight, obviously at eight hits. So, I mean, right. you, once again, we can always make the argument, but he's probably a better shot than we are. I mean, the reality well, is he's, he's 22 years old. <laughs> yeah. When I was 22, I was pretty good too, Tom. <laughs> but I think, I think about the circumstance, and we've gotten so into looking at the firearm as just a piece of insurance, so it didn't matter what it was. If I had one, I felt good about myself. I had my policy. Mm -hmm. But every time it happens, and as these events prove it's not going to be, you know, me in five yards with necessarily a guy trying to, you know, attack me with a knife. And, yeah, and yeah. I think about that guy, Tom, and he isn't just defending himself because he could have ran away. Right. He didn't. So it's more than just self-defense at that point. At that point, it's society defense. Yes. He decided not here, not today, not in my neighborhood, right. not around my friends, not with my neighbors, <laughs> not here. I'm not going to let this happen. Yeah, you know, so that's that's a that's a huge statement on just the the character of the individual and maybe the view of the world right now. Right. You know, that someone's going to take the responsibility for it. And you okay. know, when you when I think about what I would choose for that shot, mm -hmm. I have to admit that isn't the gun I would normally choose to carry. Right. Okay. If I said, yeah, and look, you got a few guns. And you get to have your choice of anything equipped any way you want. Because you've got everything from race guns to super pocket guns. And I say, all right, Rob, for all the marbles, you got to put shots on target at 43 yards under stress. What are you going to pick up? Does it have to be a pistol? Yes, it has to be a pistol. <laughs> <laughs> Do I have, to, have to be able to carry it? Okay. So putting, putting that in there, I would, I'm choosing a mid or a full size Whatever gun of your choice. I mean, this isn't an ad for, you know, who sponsors me or whatever. I would pick okay. something that I feel com comfortable in my hand mm -hmm. that's large enough that I've shot it a lot, that I'm comfortable, that I know its accuracy component, has a good trigger pull, and I know where it shoots. I mean, the big thing is you've got to know where it shoots. I mean, if, you, if, you, if you're happy with a five-yard full silhouette hit, you don't know where that's going to shoot up. 43 yards. Okay, well, yeah, 43. let's take this, uh, know where it shoots and apply that. And I'm going to say, okay, we're talking a mid-size, call it XDM. Four-inch four yep. barrel, four to five-inch barrel XDM, or whatever version of that in whatever manufacturer you want. I'm thinking, and i got to tell you, we've talked about 
this before, this leads me directly to an optic. Yep. Yep. It's, it's, you can love them or hate them. Uh, and in theory, you can say, well, all defense shootings are so close that it doesn't matter. But this is a different thing. Maybe we need a new term. Maybe self-defense is, is just the touch of what we're talking about here, and it's more something else. At that point, I'm thinking more about what like law enforcement, what mm-hmm. they're carrying is their open carry as opposed to just a concealed carry gun. And they never choose a small and light. And optical sights are becoming, well, it's the future. I mean, you can love them or hate them. It's going to happen the same right. way it did on carbine. Well, all right, if you got to make a shot for all the marbles at 40 yards, and I say iron sights are or dot. Light. You're going with a dot. You are. Every time. Every time. Not not one out of five times or 50 50. I'm picking it every time because it's better. You know, and I was and telling I somebody this week, I, I said, look, I, I told somebody, look, I'm a fair shot. I can I can hit the target most of the time at 50 yards, I think. I'm pretty sure with iron sights. But with a dot, I will just do better. It's simple as that. I'll do better with a dot. It's exactly how I feel. Uh, from the standpoint, it's not a love or hate or like the thing or they don't look good on my gun or, you know, my friends are going to make fun of me because my eyesight mm-hmm. is failing and I'm getting older, blah, 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 blah. The reality is, under the circumstance you gave me, I'm going to pick the optical sight every time, every time. You know, and I know people say, well, the batteries, blah, blah, blah. It's like just noise back there. And the only people who <laughs> talk like that are the people who haven't actually gone out and shot them much. Or they're so vested in the other side of it. And if anybody in the world should be considered the iron sight guy, Tom, it's got to be me. Because I would say the vast majority of my championships have been in division. Right. So you're only allowed iron sights to use it. True. But I don't have that restriction on this other, in this in this other in this other arena. I can have better better equipment. There it is. Hey Rob, I got a scoot here. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your insight. I value it so much. Oh, it's great talking to you. Last thought: I'm rebarreling a thirty thirty. Do I do twenty five thirty five or two nineteen zipper? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great talking that to you. That means Tom. two guns, baby. Always two guns.